In our new book, Unlocking the Potential of Post-Industrial Cities, Matthew E. Kahn, Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Economics and Business and Director of the 21st Century Cities Initiative at Johns Hopkins, and I, Mac McComas, Senior Program Manager at Johns Hopkins 21st Century Cities Initiative, study the six post-industrial cities of Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis. In the book, we look at economic and demographic trends in these cities over the past 50 years and explore ways that they could reverse these trends in the near future. We study investments made by people, places, businesses, and local government, and how these investments can help post-industrial cities make a comeback so that everyone can reach their full potential. Hi, Matt. So today we're going to talk about uh, climate change in Baltimore City. So um, I know people talk about climate change and, and mitigation and adaptation, but um, what is climate change adaptation as you see it? That's a great question. So climate change mitigation is about shrinking our carbon footprint. Uh, so Bill Gates has this new book where he's talking about synthetic meat. He's talking about electric vehicles. He's talking about solar panels and nuclear. That's not what we're talking about today. Um, climate change adaptation raises the issue of we have collectively unleashed climate change. There's a question of how, how disappointed is Greta Thurberg going to be with all of us? Of are we going to rein in globally our greenhouse gas emissions? And because India, China, and Africa are going to continue to grow and use fossil fuels, Mac, I'm very concerned that global greenhouse gas emissions will rise, and this makes it absolutely essential for all cities, including Baltimore, to begin to prepare to adapt to climate change. And to be specific there, if we face more 100-degree days in Baltimore, how do we reduce the pain that costs, whether you're a faculty member at Hopkins, whether you're a sixth grader in the city school system, whether you're a 90-year-old senior citizen, whether you're a beer drinker at Fells Point? Uh, everyone in Baltimore has the right to great quality of life. How do the people of Baltimore maintain and improve their quality of life when Mother Nature's throwing harder punches at us? And that's the climate change adaptation challenge. And Mac, I want to bring it up a notch. In our new book, and I know you know this since we wrote it together, in our new book, Unlocking the Potential of Post-Industrial Cities, we argue that the six cities we study compete against all of America's other cities. And one way for our six cities, including Baltimore, to attract more people and jobs is to be relatively competitive in adapting to climate change. So, Mac, to say that again, if Baltimore raises its game and does a better job adapting to climate change, that will actually be an economic growth strategy for the city. So, Mac, you've lived in Baltimore much longer than I have. What do you view as the fundamental challenges Baltimore faces in adapting to climate change? And do we have any advantages relative to other cities, whether it's Chicago, Seattle, Los Angeles? Yeah, so I think some of the most crucial issues facing, facing the city um, is both, uh, you know, I'll just list them out and we can go into each of them individually, but they're certainly facing uh, the, the threat of coastal flooding and riverine flooding, um, urban heat islands, uh, air pollution, um, you know, and, and, and this was just highlighted in Texas, but the vulnerability of, of the uh, electric grid. Um, but thinking about, you know, what natural advantages Baltimore has compared to other cities, well, it is a relatively compact city. So it's, it's not um, a, a, a very large uh, tract of land. Um, so you think about uh, the, just the space that it needs to manage, it's, it's relatively small. Um, and the city does have uh, a, a relatively good amount of, of green space uh, in it as well. Um, similarly, while it does face flooding risks, it's not, it's not a Florida where half of it is underwater uh, for, for significant time of the year. We're not getting huge hurricanes here. We're not getting forest fires. Um, so, you know, comparing, comparing the challenges here in Baltimore to some other places, I don't think we're facing the worst um, threats from any of these, but we are, you know, sort of in a state of the world where we have to be realistic about those challenges. So, I mean, when I think about, uh, again, some of these specific ones, um, 
I do wonder what Maryland can do to step up its game um, to prevent something like uh, what happened in, in Texas. So I know you've, you've been following this issue in depth. I mean, what do you think cities like Baltimore and, and states like Maryland can do to, to protect their power infrastructure? Mike, I'm still learning the facts in the case of the Texas freeze. And to remind our many listeners, um, going back to Econ 101, what happened in Texas was there was a freeze and the supply of power shut down, or there was much less power generation. And at the same time, demand soared. And when demand soars and supply is constrained, it, you're going to get rationing and a blackout uh, unless you expose people to extremely high prices. So, Mac, I hope that Maryland's um, Public Utility Commission thinks through how to do better next time. So, so let's talk about this. Uh, under extreme weather, what I'd like the listeners of this podcast to think about is the following. Over the last hundred years, how many times has Baltimore faced extreme weather? And to many climate economists, you can't use the past to predict the future here. So like in, in professional basketball, if Shaquille O'Neal shot a thousand free throws and he made 48% of them, that's a pretty good estimate of what's his probability of making the next one. But in the case of, because of climate change, there is the belief that if you rely on historical data, you're going to underestimate the probability of future wacky weather. Mac, a question. If the Maryland Public Utility Commission now knows that it faces a higher risk of wacky weather, you're a homeowner in Baltimore. What are some investments you hope that the Public Utility Commission will make to keep you so that your pipes don't freeze and everything that happened in Texas? Can you walk me through extreme heat versus extreme cold and what you're hoping for from Maryland infrastructure? Yeah, so so a couple of things that I've seen that um, BGE has done to to start to tackle um, you know this this very real threat is. One is, is they have a, a, a home weatherization program um, where they offer a wide range of discounts based on uh, the homeowner's level of income of insulating the home, doing things like spraying insulating foam, um, uh, putting, installing better windows, um, uh, sort of putting in insulation around doors. So just simple things that make uh, if relatively low cost ways to make uh, homes more energy efficient. Um, the second thing they've done is they've introduced um, a program on uh, peak pricing where uh, during the really hot summer days when it's 95 and I do not want to be outside at all, so I'm stuck inside, uh, so that they prevent everybody from cranking their AC up to max, um, they, they'll notify you, uh, so say in the morning when, it, when they know it's going to rise to 100 degrees, that if you uh, reduce your energy consumption, um, you could earn you know, uh, significant savings based on uh, a normal day. So I participate in that program and, and you, know, you, you get a certain amount of money depending on how much you're willing to save and this reduces the pressure on the grid. Mac, let me pick up on that, because as an economist and as a fan of Baltimore, I love what you just said. Um, so first a question, is that an opt-in program? You chose to participate in that program. Yes. So an idea that interests me very much is in every society we differ with respect to our ability to handle high prices, like surge prices. And what I think is fair is just what you sketched. Offer a, a guy like Mac McComas an incentive to enroll in critical peak pricing where Mac knows that he'll get some carrot for signing up, but perhaps 15 days a year when Mother Nature throws some wacky weather, you're going to get hit with perhaps triple or quadruple as high energy prices. And Mac, what is it about you that you're able to adapt? Is it that you on a cold day can wrap yourself in a blanket or on a hot day you strip down uh, to your boxers. Uh, hey, what is it about you that you have this ability to cope with change? Yeah, well, I, I'd say two things. Is one is that I'm relatively young and and healthy, so you know I can sweat it out. I can be cold and and be fairly tough and resilient. But also, I, I sort of enjoy being a green thumb. I enjoy re recycling and and reducing my 
uh, carbon footprint. So as a sort of personal challenge, it, it speaks to something that I that I like to do. Um, so there's sort of that that sort of personal resilience physically, but also um, just the desire to do it. And I love that BG is rewarding you for doing so. Mac, to pivot to our research agenda 21CC, do you agree that we could write a very good paper here on the take-up rate? So do you know the facts of how many people have signed up for this program? Has bg and &E been able to enroll enough people so that it can avoid the, the blackout that occurred in Texas? Uh, it can Because a point our listeners should know, if enough energy consumers sign up for critical peak pricing, that shaves peak aggregate demand, and it increases the resilience of the grid because there's less likely to be excess demand relative to supply on these extreme days because enough people have been like Mac to sign up for critical peak pricing. Yeah. So, so, so my question there was, what, if, what would be a project we'd want to do on critical peak pricing in Baltimore? Yeah, I think, I think both looking at not only just the, the aggregate uptake rates, but um, differences in, in neighborhoods, or are there certain neighborhoods that are taking advantage of them? more than others, just public awareness of the, of the program. So are, are there nudges that, that BGE can do to get people involved in the program? Are there more things they could do around sort of, you know, gamification and, and creating smart meters where people can get, you know, notifications about if you turn it down, you know, X number of degrees, you could earn $10. Uh, highlighting the missed opportunity, I think, is, is huge. I agree. Matt, you sent me that email by that friend of yours creating that gamification app. Are those guys based in Baltimore? And can you walk us through what, can a 55-year-old guy game or is this for younger people? <laughs> yeah, so they make it, it, it pretty easy and straightforward. And so this is a, a Baltimore tech company that, that worked on uh, an app to essentially help people um, engage in these actions that, that would uh, reduce their energy footprint, but also have these sort of game elements where you earn rewards and achievements that aren't just, you know, uh, uh, a thumbs up or, uh, or a little gold badge, but actually monetary incentives to do that, um, but makes it very easy to understand how to do that. And I think that's, that's kind of key in all of this is because, you know, right now I'm, I'm enrolled in the program, I get notification when a hot day is coming, but I don't know, you know, really what I've saved until uh, the following week. And Mac, let me pick up on that. Does the energy company in Baltimore educate you of what steps to take, like how to change your thermostat or to turn off all your computer equipment? Do, do they assume that you are Albert Einstein in terms of energy efficiency, or do they, is it energy efficiency for dummies, like that, those famous books? Yeah, so, so they're pretty good about highlighting, um, you know, the simple, the, the top three things you can do to reduce, reduce energy consumption on a hot day. Um, so they do give you uh, some straightforward things that you can do and, and sort of the exact sort of threshold of, of temperature that's good to set your thermostat at. Mike, let me set this up because this discussion is key for the climate change adaptation challenge because if it's over 100 degrees in Baltimore and if we expect this is going to happen more often, what you're sketching is how to use economic price signals to reduce the probability of blackouts. Mac, we've been focusing on residential energy consumption. Do you know any facts about which industries and buildings um, while Baltimore doesn't have that much industry left, do you know anything about the, whether industry and commercial real estate face similar critical peak pricing to encourage them to conserve on extremely hot days? Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure if there's a specific commercial program that differs from the residential one, but I know um, there have been a lot of state programs to push uh, LEED certified buildings, uh, and those are usually... They're, they're, you know, they can be apartment buildings, but oftentimes they're commercial buildings as well. And there's been um, a significant uptake uh, in the state and in the city in recent years. So what I'd want to know there is whether that mainly applies to new buildings, given that there's not that much new construction in Baltimore. Are there regulations encouraging existing older buildings to retrofit? Do you know anything there or, or that this is? Yeah, so I think you're right that it's it's either uh, it only applies to new buildings or buildings that are getting um, significantly rehabilitated. Mac, on the topic of retrofits, you've taught me so much 
about the Baltimore public school air conditioning issue. So let me set this up and this will turn into a question. Um, there are many children in the city of Baltimore's educational system and in May and in September, it can get very hot in their classrooms. Um, I have been disturbed by, by this news that, that I, as someone from California I, who recently moved to Baltimore, I haven't thought enough about this, that children's learning has, in public school has been injured by the heat. So Mac, a two part question, what do we know and how do we adapt to this threat so that our children achieve their full potential and learn in school? Yeah, so, so you know, we, we know that, um, first of all, not only uh, do children uh, perform worse on standardized tests when they face extreme heat, um, but also that, that some of these schools uh, have to shut down and, and you know, do early releases. So uh, when, when um, temperatures surge, so there's both the the issue where it's it's more difficult to to focus when you're sweating in a in a hundred degree classroom but also there are just lost days of learning here when they have to close the school and as as you said when when summer gets further into september and and earlier in may um this risk is greater and these old old school buildings were just not designed um to have that in mind so the city uh, has, has made a significant investment in their 21st century um, school building program to, uh, do, to construct you know, beautiful new buildings with this in mind, but they still face the, the, um, the issue that there are plenty of schools that, that don't have any new infrastructure. So they're trying to look at low cost ways that they can install AC units into some of these classrooms. And Mac, with the Green New Deal and um, I, I apologize, I'm supposed to be the expert here. In any of your reading, has the Green New Deal had bundled into it such infrastructure as investing in adaptation-friendly capital for, for schools, like, like air conditioning for these schools? Yeah, so, so a lot of it is about, um, you know, uh, making buildings ready for sort of the, the climate reality and, and um, particularly in, in insulating them and, and making them more energy efficient. Um, and, and walk me through, am I right that Baltimore schools have also faced extreme cold? So have boilers blown out? So, um, so I'm an old piece of capital. So, so in, am I hearing correctly that old schools don't perform well in extreme winter or in extreme summer? I mean, in summer heat or winter cold. And this is the adaptation challenge. Yeah, so, so this is a, another huge budget issue that the, the city schools face is just maintaining their existing old um, heating infrastructure. And again, when there is a very cold days and, and the demand on these systems rises, they'll fail. And, you know, you have these news stories of, of kids in these gigantic jackets trying to learn in a classroom that's, you know, 40 degrees or 30 degrees. Um, so sometimes they do, again, have to cancel class um, and, and kids have missed school days. So the city is trying to find ways to, um, you know, install uh, somewhat cheap uh, heating units in these classrooms to avoid that. And Mac, we, as economists, we both know that money matters and that this, this adaptation friendly capital, the better heating equipment, the better cooling equipment costs money. Can you imagine a world where Governor Hogan prioritizes this of what do we need from the relationship between Baltimore and Annapolis, between governors and mayors, and per perhaps a question bigger than Baltimore, but centered on Baltimore. What do we need in the relationship between state governors and cities to facilitate and accelerate this adaptation investment? Yeah, so, so I was surprised to learn um, uh, last year uh, that, you know, you're, you're from California, there, there's wind farms everywhere. Um, but in Maryland, uh, we have uh, little to nothing. Um, so the state just entered an agreement with, um, I believe, North Carolina and Virginia to have its first two offshore wind farms. Um, so this is sort of not only um, you know, something that, that uh, Baltimore City is behind, but uh, governors from other states are behind. And so they came up with this um, agreement across different states to build out these two really large wind farms. 
Um, and thinking about that, this also gets back to the issue of, of, um, of flooding and pollution in, in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so Maryland uh, has, has trying to be focused on um, cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay and, and reducing stormwater runoff. And this is not only an issue of Baltimore City and Baltimore County cooperating to reduce stormwater runoff, but there's a huge um, uh, issue of reducing runoff from farms in Pennsylvania. And so there's been this big battle between the two states about Maryland wanting Pennsylvania to reduce their pollution and Pennsylvania saying, you know, no, we don't really care. We don't have an incentive to do that. That's a very important issue. Mac, on financing green infrastructure, did, did the Kerwin Commission explicitly have this penciled in as one of their proposals? And can you remind our listeners what the Kerwin Commission's report is? Yeah, so the Kerwin Commission um, was a state commission that looked at the level of state funding that was being provided to schools. Um, and it, it focused more on um, investments and in, in sort of um, operational budgets rather than, than capital budgets. But um, so I don't, I don't believe that there was um, explicit set asides for capital upgrades, but the, the city's 21st century um, school building program was a combination of state and local funds that, that wouldn't, the city wouldn't have been able to do it just on their own. So that was um, pretty uh, critical cooperation there. Mac, let's pivot to the urban heat island effect. Uh, you mentioned this before, and, and I think this is a good segue. Folks, the urban heat island effect is basically when you don't have trees, when you have a bunch of cars, that cities can have hot spots that get, can be 10 degrees hotter. And, and Mac, that might actually, and it's just it, that it, it, we get really hot in certain places. Mac, you're an expert at GIS. How if we were doing a project at the 21st Century Cities Initiatives on the Baltimore urban heat island effect, how would you go about mapping the urban heat island effect? And how would we study environmental justice here? How would we combine demographic data with the, with the temperature data? Yeah, so I think, you know, you want to um, be able to identify what neighborhoods in the city face um, a greater threat looking at um, sort of impervious surfaces, um, looking at uh, open green space, water, um, tree, tree canopy coverage, so that when you do have hot days, you see um, the difference in each neighborhood and its ability to sort of absorb all that heat versus um, uh, reflect it into the environment. So, um, then obviously, as you say, you, you'd want to layer onto that neighborhood demographics. So is it the case in Baltimore uh, that poor and, and, and minority neighborhoods face a greater threat from urban heat island effect than, than wealthy neighborhoods? And, and the answer is not surprisingly yes. So, you know, then thinking about, well, what, what investments do you want to make? Um, you know, obviously you'd want to target your investments in those communities. And, and so what the city has done uh, over the past, um, I think, five years or so, um, and they were, I believe, one of the first cities in the U.S. to do it, was invest in what they call community resiliency hubs. And so these are places like libraries or, or rec centers where um, resident, residents of that live in these neighborhoods that get really hot uh, can go to cool down on, on hot days because they have air conditioning and they have places to charge your phone and they have cool water to drink and, and, and food and such and other um, you know sort of emergency um, uh, services if needed. Mac, let me jump in there because your point is crucial. And Mac, as you know, I'm always selling my own work, including our book. Um, I wrote a paper centered in Los Angeles that I know you remember from two years ago, where we documented that in Los Angeles's poorest neighborhoods, on the hottest days, there's more likely to be violent crime. And so something I want our listeners to think about is when we think about a city's quality of life, of course, um, climate matters, but also crime matters. And in my own work, I've documented that the two are correlated, that when it's extremely hot, if people don't have access to air conditioning to cool down, 
and tempers can rise and 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 there, there can there's there's too much violence on those days in the toughest neighborhoods and so mac i would say that that and i know you agree our findings in los angeles make it even more imperative to invest in adaptation that the climate change adaptation actually is an is a crime prevention approach uh, mac your thoughts i put you on the spot to agree with me yeah, no, I, I agree, and I think this issue is is a particular concern in Baltimore, um, uh, in, in part because of the housing stock. You have a bunch of row homes that are packed together, um, and so there's not you know air to circulate around them. They're not uh, a whole lot of windows that you can open. It's not you know a house with a, a plot of land on it, and there, there is. Uh, in, in many neighborhoods in the city, um, a lack of, of trees on the street uh, for shade. So you just have so much impervious service and, and not much air circulation around these, these houses. So people are, um, you know, they, they get really hot and then they go out into the street and, you know, there is a, a greater chance for these violent conflicts. Thing you don't know about me, on two different occasions, I worked in the nation of Singapore, which is like 100 degrees each day and humid. And then at night, the city comes to life because it's only 85 at night. Um, and so I could imagine in Baltimore, as progress is made in reducing crime of more people out at night, that another way to adapt to climate change is almost the siesta of, of shifting one's hours towards the cooler parts of, of the day, which is at night or the early morning. And street safety is a key input there in encouraging older people, uh, women, to, to be out and about. Mac, do we have, do you have other thoughts on these synergies between, uh, so where I'm taking us is our capacity to adapt to climate change is even stronger in a low crime setting. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and um, obviously recognizing the limitations of it in, in Baltimore, I think the city sees the opportunity because they've had things like, um, you know, late night pool parties at, at the um, public pools in the city, trying to get people out when it's cooler, but also recognizing, um, you know, that, that people need a, a somewhat safe place to go. Um, so they try to have these, these sort of opportunities to do things when it's cooler during the day, um, but also isn't just sort of out on the street. Mac, on our list, other topics we wanted to cover? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I know, I know you've uh, done a lot of, of research on this in, in your work, um, but one of the things that, that we've talked a lot about and, and we mentioned in our book is both the opportunity and the threat posed by water. So in Baltimore, you have the Inner Harbor, um, which there's been a lot of development around. Um, you have uh, the Jones Falls, which is the major sort of north-south river that, that goes through um, the city and ultimately into the harbor is a watershed. Um, but uh, you and I both know that we would never swim in the inner harbor. Uh, we would never uh, dip our toes in, in any of this water. Um, so it's, it's there, it's beautiful, um, but it, it, it both presents an opportunity in that if the city could clean it up, uh, it would be a huge asset, but also uh, a risk in both not only the pollution, um, but the flooding. And, and this is not only um, sort of the neighborhoods around um, the Inner Harbor, but those around the Jones Falls as well. So the question becomes, how does the city make investments to reduce uh, both stormwater uh, runoff into uh, the Jones Falls and other watersheds and, um, you know, make improvements so that these places are more resilient? I agree. Mac, as you know, our 21st Century Cities Initiative has formed this partnership with First Street Foundation. And what I love about our partnership with First Street Foundation is their use of pinpoint big data to inform city decision making in cities such as Baltimore about the sea level rise challenge. Once we're aware of which pieces, which direct geographical locations are at risk to face sea level rise, we then need to bring in the engineers and the ecologists to think about what are cost-effective strategies for 
protecting areas. Matt, teach me something. So where does Baltimore now stand with wetlands? Uh, it's been claimed that Houston faces more flood risk because it's gotten rid of all of its wetlands. Are you impressed at all with Baltimore's um, continued investment in wetlands? Because I view that as one strategy of how to harness mother nature to reduce flood risk. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think Baltimore City has any wetlands. Uh, there, there are some in the, in the south of the city that, that I know um, uh, organizations such as the, the National Aquarium have, have been working to clean up. Um, but I think that they've also, um, that there are plenty of organizations that have looked to, um, you know, designing rain gardens um, and sort of other uh, uses of uh, vacant land in the city uh, to create spaces where water is absorbed and there's, you know, things like permeable pavement. And um, the challenge is that uh, these projects are fairly expensive. And I think what, what, um, what we all need to do is to sort of make the, make the case um, that these are good investments, not only for, you know, reducing stormwater runoff, but also um, increasing quality of life in these neighborhoods. So if you have an old, dirty, vacant lot, you clean it up and suddenly it's, it's not only something that, that, um, that uh, reduces stormwater runoff, but it's got beautiful flowers and it's got benches and it's a nice place to be. And something we talk about in the book is experimentation. Yes, our six cities, Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis, yes, they have their, each have their own history, but they also have commonalities. And Matt, we both know that if Baltimore is the guinea pig and successfully pilots a program that turns out to be attractive to the people and helps to clean up the water, that offers this knowledge benefit that the other five cities can, can then seek funds and invest to do it themselves. Mac, I want to come back to an important point you made about how Baltimore can continue to unlock the waterway to achieve the city's full potential. In the second to last chapter of our book, we make a big point of the beauty of the city's water and that it shouldn't just be about tourists. Uh, can I hear your thoughts about, um, you and I have talked about Boba Gump Shrimp and about, uh, about the area that's going to be redeveloped. How does that link into the waterway and how do the puzzle pieces fit together to create a consumer city that benefits the people of Baltimore and that gives them a stake in environmental progress in the city? Yeah, so so you know the current state of, of Baltimore's inner harbor is is one that appeals only to tourists, and there is there are these stories that come up once or twice a year of of some crazy tourist jumping in the inner harbor because they don't know how polluted it is. Um, but I think the the city is at a moment right now where, due to the pandemic, some of these businesses have have failed, um, which is unfortunate, but it gives us the opportunity going forward to really recreate this space where it's a place where, you know, local restaurants can, can try to start up um, and, and showcase um, th their products. Uh, so really cre recreating it as um, like Baltimore has is, is one of its many unique neighborhoods and setting the water there as a, as a significant asset. So if it's something that, um, you know, there can be a uh, significant progress in reducing pollution and there has been some progress. Um, but all of a sudden there are recreational opportunities in terms of, of kayaking and boating and, um, you know, all these great things that, that people could do uh, if, if the water was cleaner. Um, so I think it's a, it's a under realized asset and, and something that's only been targeted towards tourists in the past. And I think that that's what we meant with the first word of our book title, unlocking. Uh, that what we mean, what I think we mean by that mysterious word is maximizing the synergies. Um, a Reese's peanut butter cup brings chocolate and peanut butter together. And I, I love those things. That's why I'm a little bit plump. Um, in a similar sense, as you were saying, if these funky food trucks are parked next to the beautiful water. It's safe, it's clean. You create a Jane Jacobs vibrant scene and then rich real estate developers uh, from around the region begin thinking about investing more in the city. And that, and I know we'll talk about this in a future podcast, as you build up the tax base, 
uh, you get a more vibrant city and Mayor Scott has more resources to invest in the progressive agenda that he rightfully so cares very much about. Yeah, and I think, you know, I've, I've been interested to see some of this happen around um, the Jones Falls uh, River where you have a couple places where the, the sewage smell isn't too bad because it's been cleaned up and there are things like night herons. Um, but also there, there were these old, um, old factories and, and mills, so these big old brick, beautiful buildings that were empty for, for decades after industry left. And now they're getting repurposed into um, sort of mixed use buildings with restaurants and, and lofts and office spaces in them. So, you know, I think you do see this in, in certain parts of the city where there, there is progress being made, but there's still just so much more that could be done. And I think that's, um, you know, that's, that's the, both the opportunity and, and part of the challenge. So, so to wrap up, um, one of the reasons I work on climate change adaptation is that when we anticipate a challenge, or if we as voters, citizens, and firms anticipate a challenge, this actually creates opportunities. And Mac, I know that as a Baltimore homeowner, and as just as a good guy, you are deeply committed to Baltimore. And tell an optimistic story for us to wrap up of, of, of how Baltimore will rise in the rankings compared to other cities in competing for talent, despite the very real challenge posed by climate change. Yeah, so I think, um, again, Baltimore has a, a lot of um, great people and, and great neighborhoods working on these issues. And, and one, of the, one of the areas I see um, the most movement on is in, um, you know, cleaning up uh, the physical appearance uh, and, and beautifying neighborhoods. So the city banned um, polystyrene um, containers for, for takeaway food. Uh, they're just introducing a, a plastic bag ban. So while these things might not have a huge um, impact on the carbon footprint of the city, what they will certainly do is um, help beautify the city and that there will be less of these things stuck on the street and, and fewer eyesores. They've also done, there, there are a ton of, of nonprofits and the city has done a lot of work on um, tree planting. Um, during a time when the urban tree canopy has declined in, in many cities in recent years, Baltimore's has actually increased. And um, this is because they've been very targeted in, in how they do it and, and very neighborhood based. Um, and there are lots of great local volunteers, local people who um, you know, recognize the importance of this and uh, see the value in it and um, have put their um, you know, uh, uh, sweat and, and time um, behind this. So I think uh, you see real dedication in, um, at the neighborhood level of people who have recognized the importance of this and have devoted um, time, energy, and resources into it. So that's what always makes me um, really happy is when you see people who have done an amazing job um, uh, revitalizing a vacant lot in their neighborhood and it's now a beautiful garden with flowers. I mean, and that's often due to a small handful of people who um, see this opportunity and want to unlock its potential. And that's um, uh, such, a, such a positive um, thing to see in a city that uh, has, has plenty of problems. Max, thank you very much. This was a lot of fun and informative for me. Thanks, it was a pleasure talking to you, Matt.